Big Wiser. This that new media company covering everything. I'm talking news, you ain't heard us. Cause you know it's getting buried. Social justice, get us stuff you need to know about. Fucking politics that the corporate news won't cover. You know they don't think that you could see under. But you can now, cause the people we cover, they may not be famous, but their stories should be heard. Yeah, every voice matters. We should rise and fall together. And that's why he rep progressive inside it. We down for whatever. Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Friday. Uh, this is Carrie for Progressive Insider, and I am solo right now, which means I am completely unsupervised, and it should probably scare everybody on the network that that is the case. So since that is, um, today I want to talk about one of my favorite topics. So um, Everybody has their own guilty pleasures, right? Things that they do that maybe they don't want to publicize or whatever. And uh, let's let's talk about mine. So some people like uh, reality TV, telenovelas, Real Housewives, things like that. Um, mine is uh, things like um, Bigfoot and conspiracy theories and cryptozoology and things like that. Things that that I'm just like, what if? So it's a suspension of disbelief where I can just tune out of politics and, and everything that's going on and just kind of watch it and pretend what if, right? So it could be, maybe. Um, so one of the things I think is just um, hilarious to me as a society is uh, our government has admitted that there are UFOs. There are things out there that are beyond our technology and during the age of COVID, um, not a blip. Nobody really said anything, right? All the, the other world governments, most of them have gotten together and said, yeah, we're keeping vials on this, this is the evidence we have. When we finally came out and released video from our Air Force, from very credible sources, um, not didn't, didn't even really uh, hit the social radar, which which tells you where we are right now. So I think on our Friday, we usually do kind of a, a fuck it Friday. So today let, let's, let's talk about conspiracy theories, things that have been proven, haven't been proven. And I want to um, use this as a way to kind of summarize some of the, the conversations we've already had. So uh, one of them that we had, we had this lovely woman from uh, California on Cindy Cindy was asking the question, why are people not in the streets, right? So she was um, a slightly more seasoned activist and um, she's a, a grandmother and she's looking at things from her perspective of growing up through the Vietnam War and all these people out in the streets and protesting and really affecting change in the way that a person who's not elected or without power can. And, and she's just, she posed a question, why are we not? Um, so I wanna pull that conversation into this as well as some other things. And one of the things that keeps coming up, especially for me as a journalist, um, propaganda. So uh, we know that uh, corporate owned media has now been consolidated down to five uh, tiers of ownership. And even on radio, you have Cumulus Radio buying up all the local stations. And, and this is how you got somebody like Rush Limbaugh to, to be catapulted into a general conversation because um, of this consolidation and then his model. And then Andy and I talked about um, Infowars and how all of those conversations were being propelled into the general conversation, not because of the media that they were putting out, but because it's being used as a giant infomercial to sell supplements, which, you know, more power to them, $25 million a year, go for it. The problem is um, Infowars is behind some of the alt-right Proud Boy protests that we saw like in Michigan. So our own uh, Rombathia and then Anthony Clark from Chicago went out on Wednesday to um, offer a counter narrative. And what was surprising to me, thinking back to what Cindy said, it was Rome, Anthony, one other person who's a little more liberal leaning, standing there with, uh, he said, about a hundred of the um, 
uh, Trump supporters and the alt-right supporters. So you had three guys standing there in Lansing at the Capitol building with uh, a hundred who are pushing to reopen, right? So, so Rome said he got some really good interviews and had some great conversations with these people because I think what's important to remember is we're all neighbors, right? So if something goes down, like it, in my area, we twice we've had uh, the flood of the century in almost back-to-back -back years. And when citizens are out there filling sandbags and donating them to other neighbors, nobody's asking about your political um, persuasion or what your ideas are on economics. We're just there as neighbors. So he was explaining a little bit about some of the conversations that they had there. And if, if he's got any video or things like that he can share, we'll, we'll definitely post them. But so what was the influence for these folks to be there, but not the people who are siding with um, the, the whole idea about supporting nurses and maybe we don't reopen just yet. We don't have enough protective equipment for people, let alone nurses. So um, why were, why was it just three? Right. So you can make the argument that people are working or, you know, all of these sort of things. They didn't know about it. Sure. Fine. I get that. But it's an interesting commentary on our particular society. So this is why I wanted to talk about today um, Operation Mockingbird. So um, go to your Wikipedia page and you can do a little reading on this. And um, I, I want to hear your thoughts on it since it's just me and you today. Um, I will be addressing your comments and things like that, just like I did um, uh, during the last episode. So, uh, I got it. All right. So I'm just going to check my audio real quick here. Make sure that I am being heard. Yes, I am. Okay. So, so, uh, regardless of your political persuasion, uh, weigh in on this conversation and, and let's get started. So if you've opened your Wikipedia page, really it's, it's kind of a shallow version of what was happening with Mockingbird, the CIA operation Mockingbird. So what this was is a, a concerted effort by the CIA to kind of manipulate public opinion, well, there's no kind of about it, manipulate public opinion about certain events that were happening in a ge geopolitical forum. So in particular, uh, the Vietnam War, things like this. So we also saw it again during Operation Desert Storm and, and things, um, all of these conflicts, but I, I'm going to argue as we go on that it is happening right now in a um, in slightly different form. And I, I don't know that it's the CIA doing it. I think it's us doing it to ourselves. So, so uh, tell me where I'm wrong on this, but here's where I'm going to start with, right? So one of the, the pieces that I like about conspiracy theories and Bigfoot and all of this is the, the, the other side of it. I like biographies. Right. Not necessarily um, endorsed, approved biographies, authorized biographies, but the behind the scenes from somebody who was there or put the notes together. We saw this quite a bit when um, President Trump took office and people were writing books about the first 100 days. And, you know, if it was uh, flattering, it was embraced. If it wasn't, obviously there's going to be some pushback. So so that sort of thing, I think, ties into the conversation today. And one of the lectures that you can go out and, and, and listen to for yourself is uh, Dr. Randall Woods had a lecture on C the CIA director, William Colby, C-O-L-B-Y. He's also written a book, a biography about it. And what was interesting about William Colby is here was a guy who um, grew up in a military household. His father was in the military, so of course he joined up and he went to an Ivy League school. And he was he was not from an Ivy League background. He was working class and was still, you know, went to, I believe it was Harvard. And then from there went into the military and he fought in World War II and then was picked up by the CIA uh, after World War II. Well, 
sort of towards the end of World War II. Um, and, and one of the things that kind of shaped William Colby's view of the world was he had a book with him that had the premise of the book is how much evil will good men do, good men do in the pursuit of a righteous cause. So I think that that is the theme that kind of goes through what we're seeing now, right? So if if I can convince you that something is a righteous cause, how far are you willing to go in pursuit of that? So I think that, that that is something to kind of keep in the back of your mind as we go through this particular conversation. So uh, what William Colby actually did was he was part of the CIA effort during the Vietnam War to start our own efforts to um, what they call pacification. So one of the things he observed was with um, communism, especially in um, North Korea and China and things like that, that not only were they using negative influences like torture and things to, to get the society in line, but they were also kind of seducing them too and, and getting them to think the way that they wanted them to, to look at um, situations in, in a way that was uh, would allow those governments to uh, continue with their narrative and their program. So uh, what Colby decided, Colby and a, a number of other people, I'm not going to you know, pin it all on him, but they decided that if the U.S. did not learn to employ some of these tactics as well, that we were going to lose the war. So they decided that, that, that they were going to employ some of these same tactics in Vietnam. So this is where you saw the rise of, of the CIA um, arming civilians and kind of courting them in, in a way that, that had sort of been done during World War II with, um, you know, in, in France and, and in different parts of Europe where we were trying to help civilians through German occupation, right? So this, if you study at all um, World War II and, and you know, um, everything that we did with uh, storming the beaches in Normandy, what happened first was uh, this kind of concerted effort to help the insurgents on the ground there and just kind of disrupt things. So, so they took it to a whole new level and this pacification program helped kind of coerce and things like this. And the, the reason why it's particularly interesting to me is um, I grew up um, not as an army brat, but um, in the State Department under Voice of America radio. Voice of America, for those of you who don't know, you can still listen to it in the United States and pretty good programming, but um, we have Voice of America radio all over the world, uh, and there's Deutsche Welle for Germany, and every, every government has some sort of effort to get their narrative out into the international community. So Voice of America is ours. And um, when I grew up overseas, it was interesting to me as a kid because I, I got um, exposed to propaganda and counter propaganda. So I would hear a story about what the U.S. was doing somewhere from local media. And then I could hear that story told from the U.S. perspective from uh, Voice of America radio. So, so I kind of got um, early exposure into what what is true what is propaganda and how do you put this together? And it, it probably influenced my my later career goals in marketing and communication. So, um, so all of this kind of really plays into this larger conversation. Um, so getting back to William Colby in Vietnam. So uh, this is part of where Operation Mockingbird came out because what they were doing was trying to well, the passions of uh, the American public, because we had um, all of these anti-war protesters while we were still trying to, uh, you know, make progress or achieve certain goals in the war. So um, what I find is an interesting parallel is with uh, the Vietnam War, one of the things that sparked the anti-war protests, besides, you know, people being against that kind of conflict, is um, the pictures in the media of 
bodies coming back, all the caskets. Um, so what we saw during Operation Desert Storm is that sort of um, imagery w began and then was quickly um, put aside. So they, they decided that for out of respect for Gold Star families, we would not show the caskets. Well, it has also the effect of, on the American psyche that 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 conflict is over there. It's not real. And the consequences of our decisions aren't really being understood. Like we never saw mass graves from civilian casualties in Desert Storm. We never really saw um, commentary and interviews of families for people that would be killed. We, we did hear the term collateral damage a lot. And then we saw pushback from certain individuals um, who were trying to get the word out um, about what was going on there. But, but then the, the counter narrative was always, oh, well, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're lying. They're trying to, you know, manipulate things. You know, it was the same thing that you see now when um, an unarmed person is shot down by police. First off, we understand that that person is um, a thug or 20 years ago last Tuesday they smoked weed or you, you, whatever it is. They're going to go back and find some negative for this person to help justify why this event happened and this is part of the pacification. In your mind you're like, well, okay, so there's good and there's evil. And if somebody is not wholly good, then everything that they do must be wrong, right? So, so look at uh, the 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 justice movement and Rosa Parks herself. Rosa was not the first one to sit on a bus and refuse to move. The problem was the people that came before her they didn't have a pristine background or they were a known activist or something like that. So, so their effort could be diminished in the media. And of course we saw, you know, these people are thugs and, but then here comes Rosa. Rosa was selected because she had a pristine background and she was not a person that was out there on the stage um, in, in activism circles and, and all of this. She was just this quiet, petite woman who happened to be black and they were like, yes, please. So they, they selected her for a reason to counter this pacification effort. And it worked. It absolutely worked. It's the same reason um, that, you know, your, your lawyer, if you have to go to court, is going to ask you to wear a suit, get your hair cut. All of this sort of thing is marketing and perception matters, right? So, um, getting back to this whole uh, CIA narrative and Operation Mockingbird, uh, what they did was made sure that the media narrative was consistent, that it told the right story, it used the right words, and all of these pieces came together for an American populace. So some of the things they talked about was communism bad, socialism bad. All of these things are, are put into the evil category. And what I find is interesting is I was just listening to the news uh, yesterday and as a progressive, my political views are I'm a fiscal conservative, um, socially liberal, I would say almost libertarian because um, I don't care what you do so long as consenting adults and you're not hurting someone else. But somebody like me is being called a communist and a socialist. And, and I always wonder why that is, right? Because when we, when we look at policies that have come out in the time of much needed relief right now for our economy, our small businesses, we see rampant socialism for big businesses. They're, they're literally looting the treasury. But I'm, I'm somehow a communist because I, I want to save some money and don't want people to die. Um, it didn't make sense to me. And then it occurred to me because these are all callbacks to Operation Mockingbird. So you have um, the older voter, the boomers, who have already been um, 
exposed over a number of years to these narratives of communism bad, socialism bad, therefore evil. Now these new people who are asking for, hey, just a fair shake, we're going to label them communists and socialism. So in our current media form, where we have corporate-owned media, um, I've been called a brown shirt. I've been called a communist. I've been called a socialist. I've been called just about everything. So they, they have taken somebody like me, just a mom, um, somebody who's trying to survive, trying to, to help with um, ethics and getting truth out. Um, I have now become the thug in their narrative. Um, so that means that the majority of voters in this country who align themselves as independent or unpartied are also thugs and communists and socialists because you are not neatly fit into either red team or blue team. So pay attention to some of these narratives. And, and one of the guests that we have um, talked about to, coming on our show. She's a, a professor out of the University of Delaware and she has this great curriculum where she talks about propaganda and, and does it from kind of a funny um, a comedic standpoint where here is the, the segment of the news and can you spot the propaganda here? So um, look for that to be coming relatively soon. Kind of waiting for Andy to come back for that one because I think um, he's really going to have a, a good time with that. So so she's going to present it in a much better way. But um, one of the things that, that I, I just want to call to your attention is everything that happened before is happening again. And the reason why is because it works. And I, I think we take responsibility for that. It, it, they only do it because we allow it to happen. Um, so one of the, uh, the things that kind of caught my attention is uh, Carl Rove wrote an op-ed. I've seen a couple op-eds from Carl. I'm like, Carl Rove, really? Really? This is the guy that his own party nicknamed, George Bush nicknamed him uh, Turd Blossom. So we see um, images of George Bush himself being embraced by uh, the, the, the corporate Democrats. And now we have Karl Rove writing op-eds. And what was amazing to me was his op-ed, when you start to dig into it, he was very concerned that uh, Joe Biden, the presumptive Democratic nominee, has... Um, announced these task force, task force with specific efforts towards um, certain issues. So whether it's climate change or economy or whatever, he's got these task force and he has pulled in some of the Bernie surrogates and, and people like that, like um, AOC is on the climate change task force. So we don't know what the task force is doing. We don't know what the end result will be other than to maybe massage his policy a little bit. Don't know, but Carl is really deeply concerned about that because if Joe Biden is listening to Bernie socialists, then Joe Biden will be manipulated away from the positions that he has now that Carl Rove appreciates. Did you catch that? So Carl Rove was complimentary to a point over Joe Biden. And he did not want Biden to move to the left, catering to Bernie and Bernie's surrogates. So what does that say, number one, about us, that we will publish Karl Rove now? What does that say about us, that we have a presumptive nominee of the binary blue side of the party, where Joe Biden is acceptable to Karl Rove. And what does that say about us where Karl Rove can make the assertion that it is bad for Bernie surrogates to help develop policy for the Democratic nominee because the nominee as he stands right now is just fine with Karl Rove. Okay, do you see why I'm looking at this like this is this is pacification and supreme propaganda marketing right there. So where the hell was Karl Rove for the last eight years? He was licking his wounds after Desert Storm. 
because he was one of the ones that helped write the narrative about why we were going to war and what was happening. So um, there are some really great uh, documentaries out about uh, Desert Storm and the lead up to war. Um, and then uh, you had Colin Powell, which I greatly admired. Didn't necessarily agree with him on everything, but he had a very distinguished career in the military and he was widely respected regardless of your political leanings. He was widely respected. So what did they do with him? I was, I remember being homesick the day that he went before the United Nations. Um, and so I was watching it because that's what I do. I was watching the C-SPAN United Nations coverage and I saw him up there giving the talk to the United Nations in, in his push to, uh, we were trying to push at that time to have a united coalition of nations to go into um, Iran, or I'm sorry, Iraq uh, for this war. And, and he was up there with his charts with these chemical weapons on flatbed trucks. And he was going through this explanation. They had these really nice diagrams and pictures of trucks with tanks on them. And, and I remember being near tears uh, watching that because here was this man with this distinguished career who had, um, when you described him, you would say somebody who was honest, somebody who had integrity, um, somebody you could trust. And you could see that he himself did not believe what he was saying. It was just his delivery was flat. Um, you could see it in his eyes. He was not, he was not in it. He was not trying to, and some of this I, I would say is my, my subjective view, but I would encourage you to go back and watch uh, Colin Powell in his presentation and tell me if you don't see it too, right? So I had seen him speak nationally and he spoke with conviction and passion and, and a, a measured regard for the information. Contrast that with what he did at the UN. Um, I think any objective person would say that either he didn't feel well or it's true. He, he himself did not believe it and was not happy about having to be there and make this ridiculous argument about chemical weapons on flatbed trucks. And let me tell you where that came from. Uh, PBS did a study about uh, propaganda and the war and the CIA and one of the original informants, uh, I forget the gentleman's name, he was smuggled out of Iraq. And he was supposed to be the head engineer for um, these, these chemical repositories. He was the one who said, we're building them underground. And I was the one who had to do the engineering diagrams. And what was interesting was there was only one news outlet who was allowed to speak to him. And it came out after this journalist who himself was killed in, in, um, in Iraq during the battle, it came out that he was working for the CIA. And this informant, when his story started to fall apart a little bit, he was the one who said, well, they're taking this stuff and they're moving it. Well, how do you move an underground facility? Right. So so the, the we never as a public stopped and went, wait a second. He said this, this was the lead up to war and now they can't find these things. So when you had the, our own inspectors from the U.S. as part of the U.N. going in to look for these things, we never took a moment to really critically think through this. And I think part of that is because of the economics in our country, right? So we, Andy and I have talked about how, um, you know, in this country, we went very quickly from being able to support a family on one income to now you need two parents working outside the home, right? So I, I'm not that old, despite popular opinion. I'm not that old, but I was one of the first latchkey kids in my elementary school. Um, and so now, fast forward, I, I my kid has grown, but um, I'm not that old. Now today, you, you have to have two parents working outside the home and sometimes multiple jobs. So part of this goes into the pacification. We don't have enough time 
for our families, for real conversations, for research, for education, for pursuit of the arts and culture and all of these things. And it, this is the effect that it has on us. So when we do try to find information and consume media on social media, like Facebook, if you want to keep up with your kids and your grandkids, you'd log on to Facebook. Um, but it's really short segments, right? So we all have a little bit of ADD going on right now. So that helps with that kind of propaganda. So so this is why a Carl Rove can come out in an op-ed and people go, oh, he's, he's quite intelligent. He's quite, wait a second. He helped get us into a war that we now know was all about oil and had nothing to do with freedom and protection and all of this other sort of thing. It was about the per uh, price of oil per barrel. That's what it was about. How many of our sons and daughters, moms and dads died? How many millions of Iraqis died for that? How, we are still paying for that. And, and we have never stopped to think what we're doing. And then, oh, by the way, Monday's a holiday for veterans, right? So the veterans that we promise to take care of, if you will go and defend us, whatever the reason, if you will go and do this for us, we promise that we will take care of you for the rest of your life. What have we done to the VA? Right? So, so we talked about that on Wednesday and, and Monday, what's going on at the VA in the Stars and Stripes article about uh, veterans being used as guinea pigs for um, new medications, right? Fast-tracked by the FDA and gutting the uh, Americans with Disability Act and cutting their funding over and over and over again. But we're going to have this holiday on Monday and you better bet your ass there'll be politicians out there with platitudes and photos and cute little uh, memorials and talk about America. That's propaganda. That is what that is. It's okay to be patriotic, to love your country, love your neighbor, but what you do matters, right? So if I hand you a really nice sympathy card and then I go outside on your front lawn and ridicule you and start tearing up your lawn and your house and your car, what matters more, this really nice sympathy card I gave you or what I'm actually doing? And so these are some of the critical conversations that we need to have. And all of this goes back to this uh, propaganda thing, which I think is just is so interesting. So, uh, oh, oh, it's an Andy sighting. Look it. Hello, Mr. Andy. Hello. Hello. So um, welcome. We're talking about propaganda and pacification of... Uh, the public. Oh. oh. <laughs> you might want to step out now. <laughs> you Did I tell you I have an appointment to uh, <laughs> go take care of? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm proud of myself. I made it here 50 minutes earlier than I did on Wednesday. I, I, I can't help but notice that you're still not sitting down, though. No. Uh, it's... It, it would seem that there are two problems that are, I wouldn't say unrelated, but I would say that are going to need two entirely different fixes. And the epidural that I had in my spine has taken care of pretty much most of my back issues. It's the sharp pain that I feel down my leg that I'm trying to deal with now. And I think that's just mm. a... a um, a problem with my the that side of my lower back still being locked up uh, and looking like a human question mark. So, <laughs> so for those who are not aware, Andy's been on what week three of convalescing um, from an injury. So down the hill. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So well, thank you for at least making an appearance. All of your tens of tens of fans. Will be. Oh, yes. Yes, I hear from all of them every day. Right. By mail. <laughs> By mail. Yeah. By snail mail, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so now you're, you're kind of into the modern era of my conversation about um, 
propaganda and the pacification. So I want to transition to a subject that you know very well, COVID. Oh, so, yeah. um, I've heard of that. Yes, yes. So um, this is where the conversation turns to where we are today, right? So like I had mentioned earlier, I, I have many, many neighbors here that identify with the red segment of the political party and are very big Trump supporters. So a lot of them are going with the narrative, um, and this was a hashtag that we saw on Twitter, uh, film your hospital, right? Because um, Infowars was saying that it was all a hoax, right? Infowars, the same guy who said that the Parkland shooting and all of the others were hoaxes and these were all actors who is now being sued for that, um, but they started this, oh, it's all a hoax. If you don't see ICU patients trotting around the parking lot, it's not real. So they bought into this. So they yeah. they are trying to say that it, it's not real. And one very lovely woman that, that I'm not going to name her, but I, I love her to pieces because she just fascinates me. She was saying, I don't know anybody who has died from this. And so my question to her was, well, I've lived in many different places, many different cities. I know a lot of people, and I personally know people who have passed away. You've never left the county. You only know this small area, and then you put yourself in a, a information bubble because you don't like a counter narrative to what, what you're comfortable with. So why would you think that you would know somebody. So if we have 330 million people in this country and about 100,000 people died and you don't know one of them, why is that surprising to you? Yeah, see, it's kind of like saying, um, I don't, I haven't talked to anyone today that has died from this. <laughs> right, right. Oh, so real quick, I want to um, give a shout out to Timothy Carr. Thank you for watching. He says maybe some jets will fly overhead. Well, wow. oh, I hope it's not in Canada. Did you hear that story? No. What happened? Uh, I believe the um, snowbirds are the Canadian um, uh, um, flight team that does that goes to the the different shows and does the does the trick flying and all oh, that. Oh, like our, our Blue Angels. Yes. Okay. Yes. okay gotcha. It's Canada's version of Snowbirds. And okay. you can understand why that would make sense. <laughs> um, but apparently, uh, while they were, I believe it was on the West Coast in, in British Columbia, they were doing a flyover in an area to boost morale because everybody likes to look up and clap with their mouths open while they watch. <laughs> um, but anyways, what I guess what happened was, now these jets aren't state of the art, were made last week at, you know, Boeing or De La Havilland or something. They're mm -hmm. much, much like most of Canada's military equipment was made before World War II. And um, it was, uh, I guess, one of the pilots had a malfunction and oh. um, lost to control the plane and the two occupants ejected and only one survived and the plane <gasps> flew into a house oh, and no. the house caught fire. So there was uh, one of the oh. crewmen was killed. That was last week. And uh, wow. yeah, that's a real morale booster. That is so sad. Yeah, we had uh, we had a flyover of Chicago, and you saw they released a map of where they're going to go. And I'm not sure what we were supposed to do with that. Um, okay. But, yeah, in your case, that, that just made it worse. That's like, yeah, no, no, that's... And I can't recall the last time that that crew had a malfunction of that nature. So, of course... You know, let's wait for for a, a global pandemic when everybody's depressed, and then we'll have a plane crash. <laughs> no! So now you have to have Trudeau go out there and, you know, give his condolences and what a sad time. And Yeah, man, and so now you've got, you know, 
the planes flying with one less on on whatever side that guy was on, right? So now it looks more like a line of Canadian geese going north. So it's a it's it's horrible, of course, and uh, unfortunate, but of course it's also appropriate for this time that we're in. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's if it won't if it wasn't for bad luck, I wouldn't have no luck at all. Well, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So, um, so it goes into the same thing, right? We bread and circuses. We're gonna give you these really cool jets for what? People are struggling to find food, find shelter, maintain their shelter because we only had one state that did a moratorium on um, evictions. And we still don't have rent forgiveness or mortgage freezes and forgiveness. And that was California, correct? Yeah, that was California. California is the only one that has done that. And even some sheriff offices have said, yeah, we're not going to do it. We're, we're going to do our own thing here. So during all of this, now we see the pacification program being rolled out, you know, like... Um, the president saying, I am taking hydrochloroquine, or however you say it. And then what Hydroxy, I, hydroxychloroquine. Right. Okay. I, I don't even want to mention it so that I, I'm I'm participating in that fallacy. But then what I saw was, especially in, in my local community social media pages, all of these posts about yes, it's effective and yes, this person survived it. I'm like, we are we thinking about this clearly? Right. So, um, exactly. so, so this is part of how the propaganda works. So, um, one other thing that I really want to mention really quickly, and I'm, I'm so want to get him on here so we can talk to him is the other part of the propaganda that I thought was amazing was, um, we had the Harvey Weinstein and um, Epstein and Biden Trump thing with, uh, rape allegations. And uh, the a journalist now who is taking some serious heat, Ronan Farrow. So oh, he, yeah, I didn't hear this one. Oh, okay. So he wrote this book, which, which I think from from my perspective on the journalism side goes into the propaganda and and the corporate ownership of the media, because in his book Catch and Kill, he talks about um, the Epstein case. And how he and his partner, and uh, forgive me, I don't remember his, his partner's name on this, but they were digging into the story and finding credible sources. So when we say a credible source from a journalistic standpoint, you got to have at least two that are not connected, that can corroborate, that are credible, that you can find it. When I write a story, because when I write on politics, I tend to go towards publicly available information that is already published by the state because they come after me. Um, so what Ronan and his partner did was they did put together all of this credible stuff and they went to, I forget the media outlet that they went to, I want to say ABC, ABC, um, and, and they wanted to publish it and the story was, what they say, killed. They caught the story before it broke and then they sat on it to kill it. So that's where you get the title, Catch and Kill. So Ronan and his partner sold the story to someone else. They made their pitch, got it published, and that's how we got the Epstein and we got all of these things coming out. And even Ronan himself, whose sister, um, you know, had some issues. And he, he even came out with uh, his own apology on behalf of his behavior with his sister talking about, I, I, I told her and her situation just to ignore it, move on with your life. So, so for him, this story was uh, a way for him, a uh, cathartic so that he could put the story out no matter how horrible it was. And one of the people that was implicated in the story was Matt Lauer. And we now know that Matt Lauer in his desk. Now, now I'm going to tell you, uh, when I worked at a really big insurance company, Andy, you look like you're going to fall over. Are you okay? No, I'm all right. Keep going. Okay. Keep going. Just, just ignore the, the I'm panic. Listening. I'm listening. I'm multitasking. <laughs> well, okay. So when I was a consultant at a very large insurance company, um, health insurance company, I had a button under my desk 
And I, I remember going, well, what is this button for? And it was security. It was like, uh, because of the nature of the work that we do, if somebody's in your office and they threaten you, push this button and security will come. Right? I'm like, you're kidding me. But, you know, it's, it's a giant health insurance company and they're evil by nature. So, of course, I had a security button under my desk. So when the news came out that Matt Lauer had a button under his desk to lock his door, in my head, I'm like, yeah, totally. Makes sense. I get it. Absolutely. But what he was using it for <laughs> was decidedly different than personal security. He was taking away the personal security and safety of the very nice woman who was also in his office. Right? Right. Right. <laughs> well, I, he was just making sure she was safe. Too. <laughs> but she wasn't. She was locked in with him. <laughs> so, um... Wasn't he given the nickname Hansy? Yes, 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 he was. Lovely person. Yes, he was. So, um, I think that it was, wasn't it, uh, that he and Al Franken were the biggest, uh, Me Too disappointments on the left in that whole time? Yeah, like, I mean, of all the people, yeah, have to catch being assholes, you caught these two. Oh, good. Thanks, guys. Thanks for your help, right? And I, I will say, over my career. Um, when I was younger, uh, I, 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 what? <laughs> when you're younger, when you're in your teens. Right. And no, younger in my career. I, I did have issues sometimes with men behaving badly, but because I have always been snarky and my give a fuck has been really low, I mm. learned to deal with it in ways to make sure that it would never happen again. And I knew that HR wasn't going to do anything. So I would take it upon myself to address these things openly. So I had one gentleman who would constantly um, stare at the boobs, constantly. When he talked to you, you didn't exist, constantly stared at you. And this was kind of a thing that the women in the office, we, we knew it happened. We would laugh about it, make fun of it behind his back. So one day he was doing it and I was just like, okay, I've had enough. So I got down on one knee and started talking to a zipper to answer his question <laughs> and of course he was he was taken aback he's like what are you doing i'm like i'm reciprocating <laughs> so needless talking, talking to willie <laughs> i'm like so needless to say that sort of thing didn't happen with him uh, uh again um but so here you have matt lauer um doing this uh to his co-workers his colleagues People who worked for him, worked with him. So now Matt Lauer has decided that he's going to go after Ronan Farrow because he doesn't like what Ronan... Are, are you falling down? Is that what's going on? What are you doing? No, no. Just ignore me. If I fall down, it'll be followed by a loud thump. So you'll know that it's happened. So I mean, I'm doing okay. Keep going. No, no offense to you, Andy, but I don't believe you. <laughs> Anybody who's watching this sees you swaying. <laughs> no, the problem is that I I can't, I still can't sit down, right? I can mm. either stand or lie down. Um, um, my back is still glitchy when I try to sit. So okay. I'm standing with one knee on my computer chair and my computer chair has wheels. Oh, is that what's going on? <laughs> so Think of me as the roller skating because what's going to happen next is Annie's going to be <laughs> standing in front of press talking about how we at Progressive Insider have forced him to come on camera through this. <laughs> That's right. I'm a, I've been deemed an essential service. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm like Sean Spicer and the, and the moving uh, uh, podium. Yeah. Okay. Yes, there you go. Ah, come and get you, you bastard. Spicy. I miss Spicy. He was great. I loved was, him. I loved his use of the single English language. <laughs> it was creative. Oh, wait, wait, wait. We got a comment here from Joel. And Joel, I'm going to butcher your last name because it looks Polish to me. Dizak, I'm half Polish, so I should know better. But uh, he says, no connection to the Trump family trust invested in the manufacture of the drug. So that was something that came out. Um, the the hydro blah, blah, blah. Um, Hydroxychloroquine. Yes. Um, 
that uh, there's speculation that Trump himself may have invested heavily. So he's trying to push it in order to not have a loss of money. So what if a few people die? Like the Stars and Stripes article talked about some veterans did die. Um, but hey, you know, they're just veterans and it's only Memorial Day coming up. So we'll just... They just, they just want free stuff. <sighs> Thank you. Hey, yeah, free stuff that might kill... No, we're telling these people that if you're a true patriot... You will sign up and volunteer to be a lab rat for this untested um, application of a drug that has known side effects. So, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, so that, that pretty much concludes my rant. I got through my entire list in a very hatchet job way of explaining this, but I would... Ex I would say um, go look up Operation Mockingbird, and then um, after the show, I will try to post this lecture uh, that it was. I found it fascinating. So it was Randall Woods, Professor Randall Woods, his lecture on CIA Director William Colby and how Colby got to be the mastermind of this whole program that still exists today. So um, I find this stuff fascinating. I hope you will too, because it helps explain where we are today, why we're there, and then for me personally, why we're doing what we're doing right here. So obviously I have a progressive bent, but I want people to understand that progressive is not socialism. It's not far left. It's not as Karl Rove said, Karl Rove said, I call us radicals. Uh, no. We're center. We're center policy. Um, so when Karl Rove calls me a radical, I want you to take a critical look at that because Karl Rove's the one that sent um, men and women, helped send men and women to die for the price of oil. So, yeah. So Seems, and, and, seems normal. <laughs> Totally credible. Um, and, and the work that we do here, we do the old fashioned stuff. So we check our sources, right? So um, I will talk to somebody, check their credentials, make sure that, you know, maybe they're not a CIA operative, maybe they're not a Democratic operative or Republican operative. And then I go and find um, people who are saying something contrary or people who corroborate the story. And how valid is that? And we do all of that before we publish our own stories. And there are a number of uh, other sources like The Intercept that does it. Um, the Gray Zone, the just, uh, I would say, status quo does the same thing. Uh, so these Democracy are... Democracy the, Now. Yes, yes. Common Dreams a little bit. Um, so the, not, not political. No, political. Oh my goodness, political. They could be the one of the absolute worst for Absol you know, yeah. trying to create a narrative out of thin air. Yeah, well, they should. They should have a little disclaimer that solely owned subsidiary of the Democratic establishment, right? And, and, and that's it, right? Like, I mean, that that's the one thing that pissed me off the, about the hit pieces that were coming out when the pandemic first started and they were talking about, you know, AOC is no longer progressive. She's, she's towing the establishment line. Politico does a hit piece on AOC at the second Tuesday of every month. Right. And so how, how are susceptible are progressives to that? We have to stop getting, getting in our own way with, with stuff like that, right? It's ridiculous. Come on now, people. We've got to remember where this information is coming from mm -hmm. and who's paying for it. Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, and I have personally pushed back on Jimmy Dore and other people who are, are anti-burning because um, the way that I look at it growing up as I did, everything that Bernie said now, POW rules are in effect. Right. So uh, that's when, when Bernie says we all must come together. I'm like, OK, Tokyo Rose says, got it. OK, so I'm going to look at that critically. This is where we talk about critical thinking. So if you're spending expending so much time and energy pulling apart what Bernie is saying right now and talking about how he's been a traitor, you're missing the point. Right. So. Exactly. So, yeah. So. 
look at what they do and like anything that Bernie says now with his task force, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna put that over there. It doesn't doesn't really matter to me right now. And no, it doesn't. And people people are doing this wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, you're not thinking about the whole picture. And we've talked about this at infinitum, right? Like Bernie, 78 year old guy, right, is not this the savior that people are you know making him out to be he's not going to you know turn turn uh um water into wine this is not bernie sanders is the catalyst of a movement of people that will take over the united states eventually it's just a matter of when and how many people wake up to this fact and yeah. start to make positive change instead of just going around willy-nilly saying you know, oh, the sky's falling, the sky's falling, or whatever, right? Uh -huh. So that's that's the real change that has to happen. People have got to realize that Bernie Sanders started this, but not me. Remember, not me. Right, but... well, I, I would push back that Bernie actually didn't start it. He's been talking about it for a while. Um, the American public started this... Um, it, it would stock under Vietnam and then it morphed into some other things. And then the, the latest iteration was Occupy Wall Street, where we started to start asking uh, some pertinent economic questions about, wait, something's terribly wrong. And then and then Bernie came on the scene. So people who've been following Bernie through his whole career know that, that he's been talking about this for a while, but then so have they. So here's one big... Uh, one big idea to consider, and this is for all the um, fans of the I Hate Don Ford fan club. <laughs> Don brought up a really interesting point. He said, what if all of the progressives that are running for office, state and federal, and particularly those who are running for Senate, we just interviewed one of them, um, what if those people got elected and we flipped the Senate and we flip the house to more progressives, right? We turn the squad into a brigade. Would it matter who sits in the White House? Not at all. Exactly. So there are elections happening. Oregon just had theirs. June 2nd is the new Super Tuesday. Huge races going on all over the country. And all of them, most all of them now, including Texas, uh, have mail-in ballots. Um so that you can participate safely. So if you have a primary election coming up June 2nd, between now and June 2nd, you must vote. And um, the, the movement for a democratic society or American democracy, MAD, M-A-D, on Facebook is putting out all of these state lists, right? If there is a true progressive in a race, their name is on the state list. If there isn't a true progressive, then you've got just the generic corporate Dem versus whatever. But they, they've highlighted all of these state by state by state. So New York, New Jersey, all of these really key races, Georgia. Um, these, are, these are really important that, that people need to be paying attention to because we have the opportunity right now, right now, to pay attention to what's going on in elections and choose the best progressive candidate so that Joe Biden, Trump, doesn't, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter because we are not electing emperors. They only have a finite amount of power and it's the legislator, the legislators who create the bills and pass the laws. So what we would see now under the HEROES Act, Pelosi stripped out help for small businesses, wouldn't happen. Wouldn't happen if we had more people in there who understood economics, especially macroeconomics and how things work. So, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Imagine what Congress looks like. I mean, right now you basically got AOC, Jayapal, uh, Tlaib, um, Omar, Presley, Kana. Imagine what that looks like when you add Shahid Buttar, um, 
Lauren Ashcraft, Jen Perlman, Morgan uh, Morgan Harper, Chris Armitage, um, you know, Dan Whitfield, Zagera, all of these uh-huh. grassroots progressives that are young, full of piss and vinegar, and are all come from us. They're all come from the working class or lower, and they're all ready to kick some ass because they're tired of the bullshit. That changes everything. Absolutely. As soon as you get more than a handful, you've got a group. And a group of those people can't be bargained with anymore because they can stick together. Right, exactly. So so Pelosi, a figure like Pelosi, even as the Speaker of the House and the majority leader, loses influence, right? So every time I see AOC, who is, who is not a saint by any stretch, but... Um, Pramila and all of these people who are made to fall in line in the back of my head because I like those bio- biographies and the behind the scenes things. I'm thinking, what deal was struck here for them to have to fold, right? Because I just saw Pramila say, okay, look here, bitch, you stripped out my legislation for small businesses out of the Euros Act. I'm going to go around you. And um, Senator Sanders and I are working on Medicare for all during COVID so that people are not out of expenses. And I'm going to go around you and put out this legislation for small businesses because you stripped it out. So that is what I see as a a true move for uh, Jayapal. And then I see her have to fall in line for another vote. So I'm like, okay, what happened here? What do we not see? So you're right. Let's give her some more so that... Instead of five, it's 30. And let's flip the Senate. And yeah, we're done. Exactly. Well, exactly. we're not done. We still have state races and then all this bullshit with the DNC. Although we did just elect a, a number of progressives to the DNC in California. So, woot, good job. Um, so maybe we can get some reforms there. And at the same time, people are working on uh, viable alternatives to Team Red, Team Blue, same party. So, yeah, Dem enter, Dem exit. I love it. I love yes. it. So, all right. Um, two minutes after the hour, Andy. So any any final statements for the, the week that was? And um. Uh, do you mind if I give a shameless plug for uh, for for my uh, uh, for MNC coming up? Yeah, go for it. All right. So this this weekend for Macro and Cheese, which I am the producer of, or Real Progressives, um, we have a very very interesting uh, podcast coming up, and it's from a national outreach call that we had in March with a uh, brilliant gentleman named Rohan Gray who is the founder and president of the uh, Modern Money Network. And he, interestingly enough, was one of the consultants talking to uh, Rashida Tlaib's uh, crew about minting the coin. In Mint one the of, coin! This is a br- brilliant um, uh, mm-hmm. idea of his and how that, whole process made sense and how they are trying to uh, uh, push that through to get Americans some actual help instead of just some pseudo help that they've been getting for now and, and some misinformation. And uh, it's uh, so it's, it's coming up on Saturday at 8 a.m. And it is a one is uh, on top of Extremely intelligent guy with an amazing memory for details in history. He's a great storyteller. Too. So it's something that you can put on and listen to and just get um, completely involved in it and forget about the world that we currently live in. <laughs> I, and and uh, I will freely admit, Saturday morning while everyone else is still asleep, I've got it playing because um, it's, it's fascinating stuff. Um, and, and this is how you really learn good economic theory from world-class economists and do it for free in your jammies. So I highly encourage everybody. Um, it's an excellent, excellent podcast. And um, since Andy's not going to brag about it, I will. What are you on, week 64? No, this is, and, and I I'm, I still have to send Rowan a, a, 
a disclaimer a apologizing for the uh, for the snickering going on because this is week 69. <laughs> All right, week 69. So that is unheard of a podcast every week for 69 weeks. And it's these are like world class folks. And it's okay, it's macroeconomics, and you'd think that it would be dry, but it's not. The way, like, um, my favorite is Captain Black. Um, and, and his snarky way that he tells things. So, so yeah, I, I highly encourage everyone to listen to Macro and Cheese for the the economics. Um, so you, you're just going to learn so much. So, Andy, yeah, kudos to you. Um, and, and, okay, so for me, before I get out of here, I just want to thank everybody who joined the conversation this morning. Thank you. You're awesome. So this is Timothy, Joel, Rita. Rita had a lot to say, and I didn't read any of your comments. Rita, I suck, but Rita was talking about um, Alec creates the laws, A-L-E-C. Uh, go look up Alec. They're interesting because they have bipartisan support. Weird. Weird that a uh, oligarchy, fascist-based organization has Democrats supporting it. So, um, have I shown you my shock look? <laughs> yeah, do it, do it. Yeah, but thank you to everybody who uh, participated this morning, who weighed in, and um, I will definitely be back on Monday. Andy will be on a skateboard, maybe. Uh, back at the roller rink for Monday morning. <laughs> right. And um, so so now that Andy's sort of back, I'm going to reach out to the professor, University of Delaware, so we can have a good laugh with propaganda. Um, and she has this really fun, amazing way to teach all of this stuff. And I want to get her scheduled for an interview. And then um, Ronan, if you're listening, Ronan Farrow. It is my sole goal in life to get you on the program, and I want Don Ford on it, too, because I think the two of them could be cousins. I think they look so much alike. Different personalities, but uh, it's the parent trap grown up, because you have Ronan, who came from, you know, basic U.S. royalty, and then Don Ford. So... So I think that that would be that's just the court jester. Such fun, <laughs> right? Exactly. So, so all right. So for me and Andy, thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. We're getting out of here. Enjoy your weekend. Please stay safe. So, with that, we're gone. This is Progressive Insider. Yeah. Progressive Insider, you know they wiser Ooh. Ooh. It's that new media company covering everything yeah. I'm talking that news you ain't heard of Cause you know it's getting buried Social justice